everybody. Uh, welcome to today's TA reading. Um, I am Molly Godry, an assistant professor here at Stony Brook University. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, host this event. Um, we have seven excellent TAs reading today and um, sharing their work with you all. And then afterward, uh, Julie Sheehan, director of the BFA program, will moderate a Q&A session for uh, everybody who's attending here. Um, our first reader is Amy Shiner, a writer of essays, memoir, fiction, children's stories, essays, and memoir, fiction, essay, essay, children's stories, memoir, fiction, 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 then again, you weren't there either. I remember a few years before when we spoke on the phone, I meandered down Commonwealth Avenue, most likely preoccupied with homework, friends, myself. I thought I was finally free, finally able to be the person I wanted to be. I never thought about you. You sounded different. I was used to your ramblings, your endless storytelling, your repetitions, but something had changed. You were not yourself. I hadn't talked to you in a while. We weren't as close as when I was a child. I didn't know why you kept repeating yourself with pointless babbling. I didn't know why you thought this was important to tell me. I didn't know. I didn't understand. I'm sorry I was annoyed. The most painful part of all of this is when you announced to the family, I know what's happening to me with tears in your eyes. I wasn't there. How you prized intellect above everything else. Your intellect was your identity. Your intellect was all that mattered. Of all the diseases to consume you, why did the most vengeful? Perhaps your lifelong relationship with anger was finally justified. I hope you understand why I couldn't come to your funeral. You see, I wasn't really there either. I'm surprised I ended up somewhat like you. We're both world travelers. We both love the thrill of stepping off the plane and not knowing where the day could take us. We're both stubborn and set in our beliefs. We both cry when we're angry. My family has your book on our shelf, weathered now and perhaps outdated in nature, but revolutionary when published. You were a trailblazer. You cared about justice. You felt wronged. I do too. Maybe one day I can keep my book next to yours. I remember being five or six years old, sitting in a lecture hall as you prepared to teach your American history class. We have a special guest with us here today. You direct the class in my direction. All those faces, they seemed so old to me then. They were the age I'd become when you weren't there anymore. I busied myself coloring with carnation pink and robin egg blue during the class. And later when family members asked how, how I enjoyed it, I responded, grandpa talked and talked and talked. How you loved the sound of your own voice. The last time I saw you, you weren't there. It was as if time had reversed. Your infantile body, wide, unblinking eyes, empty stares. You didn't know I was there, which is okay because I wasn't really there either. I held back te tears and punished myself for feeling. I'm sorry I didn't hold your hand when you took your last breath. The last time you filled your lungs with air, the last time you exhaled, I was on the other side of the country fighting my own demons. Now I'm learning how much you loved being a grandfather, how you were much better in that role than you ever were a father. I should have thought more about you when you were here. I stopped sleeping over on weekends. I stopped listening to your stories. I stopped listening to those never ending stories. The last time I saw you, I should have told you stories about how you used to take me to the movies, fall asleep, and after rate it with three farts instead of stars. How you played make believe with me and did all the voices for the stuffed animals. They spoke gibberish, which I thought was a real language. You performed so well. How you took me to McDonald's and put all your French fries in the center of the table to share and didn't say anything when I ate them all. How you'd sit in your study, blasting La Traviata and La Boheme on your record player, lost in thought. The study, musky and dark. When you take me into New York City and we rode the train and you pointed out the window and said, look, there's New York City, when you proclaimed there was no other place like New York City, that New York City was the center of it all. Do you remember when we walked past the Twin Towers just two days before? You still consider New York City your home, although you escaped your oppressive origins all those decades before. Religion was the worst thing that ever happened to you. Before you weren't there, while you were still there, you kept telling me a story, a story I never heard you tell before. You were eight or nine or 10 years old. Your grandmother had just died. You lived in a boarding house in the Bronx back when the borough heard more Yiddish than English. You had family in the apartment upstairs and family in the apartment downstairs. I struggled to make sense out of your confusion, but an image struck through and still remains. 
You kept talking about the women in your family, carrying these heavy buckets of waters up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs. The sound of their low heels clunking on the hardwood steps. The heavy traditions filling the silence. You watched them. I pictured little Seth with suspenders and high socks, wide-eyed, studying, absorbing. The women, they went to wash the body of your grandmother. Your grandmother who spoke a different language. Your grandmother who left home to find a better one. They didn't have funeral parlors then. I remember them carrying the buckets. You strained to speak. You were almost there. The sound of their shoes on the steps, the buckets swishing, the steps. I have never heard a more visceral story before or since. I felt myself there with you, watching, witnessing. I didn't realize the gift you were giving me. When you finally weren't there, I wanted to be there. Truly, I did, but it just wasn't possible. Or at least, it wasn't the right decision for me. I swear I just couldn't, because I wasn't really there. I was off being a trailblazer like you, undoing a century of familial strife, anger, and irresolutions. I was worried what you would think I was being selfish, that I was always selfish and nothing would ever change. The family would whisper about my selfishness. How could she not attend her own grandfather's funeral? They didn't know what was happening to me and neither did you, but I like to imagine you understood, or perhaps you understand now. I'm sorry I didn't visit your grave until 10 months later when my mom unexpectedly joined you, but I didn't see it then either. I couldn't. If you were here, I would tell you a story, a story about a girl who hated herself, who, do whatever, who did whatever she could to change herself, who didn't know what was happening to her. I swear, I really didn't know. If you were still here, I would tell you a story. I would tell you a story of what it's like to be so angry, a story we shared. I would tell you it's not worth it. Your parents, the Orthodox Republicans, they're not worth it. Don't you remember strolling across the Charles Bridge in Prague? Don't you remember the overwhelming beauty, the feeling of utter serenity? I was there too. I imagine you were there with me. I'm sorry you went through the worst hell you could ever imagine for yourself. Life really is a cruel irony. I'm sorry I didn't grab your hand and tell you a story. I'm sorry I didn't grab your hand and yell, remember, 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 but I couldn't because there was no me and there was no you. And I'm sorry to say, I'm the only one still here. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Alex Snitkowski. Um, Alex, is, has worked, uh, Alex has worked published in the Southampton Review, Bodega Magazine and Hobart Pulp and is forthcoming in Griffel. He is currently working on a novel. Hi, thank you, Amy. And thanks for sharing. Um, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is something that I've been working on. Um, the highway is lined with empty cars idling on the shoulder. A black two door goes careening by, its windows down and the heat on. A metallic disco beat wafts out into the night and lingers in the air, leaving an echo at each mile marker a single movement of music, maybe two notes or half a vocal bar that hangs in the wake. Inside are two men, one suit, driving, gesticulating wildly to Donna Summers as I feel love, the other emaciated in the passenger seat, wearing a bucket hat and a bowling shirt. Seamless production, Suitman says, you can't even tell how the drumbeat generates the syncopation, an ethereal manifestation. The craft is invisible. Beautiful stuff, man. Beautiful stuff. They've been on the road for two days now and have, against their agency, wound up on a state road on Long Island on a Sunday. It was a short trip down to South Carolina to Kiwa Island. They can't remember why. Then tearing rubber north to Pittsburgh and then out to the east end of Long Island for... There is a package. It comes to emaciated man this time, although there isn't always a package. No questions asked, though. They picked up a box from the home of an ex-quarterback, met him on a golf course at dawn. A golf course isn't totally right. No, dawn is correct. Suit man is certain of that. He's speaking in theological terms now. Marauder comes down like the angel Gabriel, the spokesman for God, not incarnate, but close enough. Donna Summer, Mary, the beautiful virgin mother herself. He gives her pregnancy, the beat, her own little immaculate conception. Voila, she sings, Christ is born. It was dawn and they were just off the golf course. They're both certain of that now. Sometimes suit man and emaciated man are on the same wavelength, unbeknownst to one another, like their minds have melded into one without their awareness. Emaciated man knows it was dawn. Suit man knows it was dawn. They both remember it now. Knee high sawgrass, yellow, dead in winter, scratchy. Emaciated man wore shorts and the leaves brushed his knees. 
The golf course was to their west, behind the ex-quarterback, whose jaw was shaped square, a relic of mid-century aesthetics, and behind the duo, a low-hanging low hanging cherry laurels, Prunus Caroliniana, kept the beach, the winter Atlantic, a little stormy and rough at this time of year, out of sight. The sunrise, too, although that broke through in spots of orange and yellow that cast themselves upon the ex-QB's face. He had handed them the package and an address in Pittsburgh. No questions asked. Repeat, no questions asked. As long as it's not drugs, suit man and emaciated man drive anything. No need to get busted up by any local police departments or worse, the feds, a whole cascading series of events, immunity offers, plea deals, etc. They took it up north through the tidewater, up through Charlotte, and entered into the Appalachians in West Virginia, took turns tight on mountain roads, almost tumbled into a mine shaft or two poking just over the shoulders, made an exchange in Pittsburgh with an old Polish woman steaming pierogies and sauerkraut in a brick row home, her family in the back room, suit man and emaciated man with her in the kitchen, eating off small plates as she rifled through a drunk door junk drawer for a key to a safe in her basement, waiting for her to produce the porcelain doll from Warsaw, pre-war smuggling jog, Slavic features, dress painted pewter blue that she sent them back east with through Pennsylvania past Altoona, Williamsport, Hershey Park, abandoned retail centers in hard coal country. They know it well, shortcuts, interstates, county roads, the raw tendrils of potholed concrete, the anthracite overcast layered over hardware, hardware emporiums and automated fast food joints evaporating with familiarity. Um, yeah, that was mostly exposition. So, <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, reading up next. Uh, Karina Cohen is a multi-genre writer and MFA candidate at Stony Brook University. Her work has been published in the Brooklyn Rail Chronogram and the Stones Thrower for you. So uh, I will let her take it away. And... Thank you, Alex. Um, so I'm just gonna read a handful of poems that I started in Julie's class last semester. Each time I see you. My lingerie is like Sargento string cheese. I snip the laces baby hair each time I wear it. It has black spiraling semi-see-through, semi-see-you flowers like oil swirls in water, the lava lamp of underwear. Fabulous fabric, am I still cool? Your strands, your thin threads are like sesame seeds flying off flagels. There is always more of you. You are so comfortable with me, you loosen, unwind, you yawn even. I like the idea of being a woman so wild, her underdress becomes it. Instead, I worry we are unraveled, unspun, a one and done each time. Um, this one's called Great Event. To prom, I invite all situations. Some drink vodka behind the door and I am knocking to see what's happened, like the police, like a suspicious sister, none of which I am. The one I am dating says I look better without the war paint. He spent the rest of the night collapsed into his phone, indifferent. Can you at least look like you like each other? Says fun mom, taking our picture. She thinks I should go to Vassar. It's artsy. It's expensive. We troop on the party bus, the dance floor. Not one slow song, just active soldiers in form, uniform, going rogue to beats. I want to know who is responsible for the fact that I chose to wear a funeral shade because there is a man down, man down. One of the situations is down in vomit. The others take his after party ticket and leave him for dead. This one's called Much To Do About Shape. It is the start of a new decade, but our bodies are still in the cookie cutters. What does a dessert body look like today for you? Your neighbor down the block loves a good gingerbread but lets it get stale into spring. Secrets. Is it bad to go cannibal? To cull entomans or nature's promise and chew at your tummy? We want to know. In Judaism, when baking challah, a piece of dough is removed from the rest, prayed on and burnt. That is what makes it not just bread. Tell me what your customs are, the ones you probably don't do. 
make a meeting with your town and don't attend. Go live among the trees and commune, caucus, creep. Sprinkle yourself, slip from grown up Hansel and Gretel pockets, be left for crows. Um, and this is my last one. It's called, If You Give. Nonsense knows anonymous ninnies. Nonsense anonymously, and you will know moose muffins from Nancy. Nancy muffins around the moose. It sniffs the air at her. It snips her nipples. I myself claim not to have them. Know anyone who snips the hair? They are all over Instagram, snap, nap, and snap again. Not shirtless yet, but nearly. Nancy nearly, nearly Nancy, na 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 na, oopsie. I save her pictures to learn the body. I myself claim not to have that body yet. Nancy is peach body ready. She is all muffin, just moosing around. If you give a girl a duck, she will trade you some tea and raspberrying. If you give a girl a duck, she will know it is a bad, hot deal from both ends. Porridge asks the bears who they are before being eaten by Nancy. Her hunger embarrasses me. She did not stop for honey. The bears aren't getting along. They have separate beds and everything. I myself claim not to have known any of that. No one ever asks Nancy, why do you give your goods to so many nooses? I myself claim not to have either. Thank you. Um, so up next, we have Chelsea Diaz Amaya, who is an MFA candidate at Stony Brook University. And her story received an honorable mention in the Craft Short Fiction Prize 2020 and she has an essay forthcoming in the Southampton Review. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a small part of an essay I'm working on. So it says, it was before I knew what a secret was. Behind a bed frame, I had found my sister's diary on accident and read the whole thing. I confess to you that I read it, but I didn't understand any of it, didn't know who people were. She mostly wrote about others. You can't just steal people's secrets, you said. On our next trip to the dollar store, you looked for plant seeds and watering pots, and I went straight to the office supply section. I had four quarters to use wisely. I chose one with a puppy cover, and you sighed and said, another journal. I told you this one was for my secrets, and your eyebrows rose to your hairline, and you asked me, which secrets? And I shrugged, but you let me get it anyway. For a long while, the puppy journal remained empty. Every time I wanted to write something down, something I thought was worthy to be called a secret, I'd ask my sister. For example, do you think having a lot of cousins is a secret? Or that the homeless man across the street asking for coins is a secret? And she'd laugh and say, no, leave me alone. The journal stayed empty, and by the time I was in the third grade, I decided to give the journal away to my only friend at this new school, because I wanted her to continue saying hi to me the following year. But she didn't, and you told me to forget her, and that she was making our friendship a secret from her new friends. And I wanted my puppy journal back, wanted to write this in. It was before you learned how to say hitherto. You were reading a book at the foot of my bed, my pale blue walls stained by the sunset. I laid wrapped in a hand-me-down comforter. I had just returned from the library a trip I had planned a week beforehand, down to my outfit. I chose high-waisted white shorts, which were originally high-waisted bell-bottom jeans that you had told me not to cut. I used the scissors you told me not to touch, the scissors you said were only for hair. You had asked me to grab you a book, any book you said, maybe history related. You said you liked autobiographies. Now I think you were just ready to jump into another time period, into another life. I don't blame you. At the library, almost before I left, I remembered your request. I stopped at a random stack and I pulled a book off the third shelf. You sat on my bed and you were grateful, looking at the cover's illustration, reading line by line, and then you said hit her toe, chopping up the word in your thick accent, and we laughed so hard we choked. 
When I gave you the correct pronunciation, you groaned your distaste for the English language. What a stupid word, you said. You asked me what it meant and I shrugged. What a stupid girl, you said, and you squeezed my knee. It was before you started reading Little Women and said it reminds you of your son. You said there was a character that acts like the man of the house. You told me David always used to lock the doors at night when my father worked in Queens. I remember my brother making a habit of it after eating a jelly sandwich and washing it down with a glass of whole milk. This was before we realized our whole family was lactose intolerant. After a trip to the bathroom, he'd lock the doors and walk around the house like an inspector. He'd pass us as he walked toward his room. We were usually watching American Idol on a mattress you laid in the living room because we didn't have a couch and your bed frame was still in Queens. You'd tell him to suck in his belly. You didn't know he physically couldn't, that he was bloated from the milk. My brother bothered would respond, I'm the man of the house. Like his belly was a man thing like locking the doors was. And you would sigh and I'd beg both of you to shush because I wanted to focus on Paula Abdul's face on the screen. Now Little Women is on the coffee table untouched. The other day you asked me if I remember that mattress. Yes, mom, of course, I remember. That winter I had to walk to school and I wasn't used to the snow. We made, it, we made a cocoon on that mattress because on some nights the heat didn't work. When one of us got the flu, we all got the flu. At the end of the season, I couldn't yell when Kelly Clarkson won because you gave me a tea with so much lemon, a tea so sour I lost my voice. When the night closed in around us, you told me you didn't want to finish the book because it makes you miss when my brother used to live with us. That night before I went to bed, I made sure the doors were locked. Thanks. Um, I'm happy to introduce Grace. Grace Dilger is a poet, educator, and MFA candidate at Stony Brook University. Her work has been featured in Peach Fuzz Magazine, the Southampton Review, the Elevation Review, the Brooklyn Quarterly, Brody Mag, and the forthcoming issue of Southeast Missouri University Press's Proud to Be, Writing by American Warriors, Volume 9. Take it away, Grace. Hi, thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, Molly, for organizing. Um, I'm going to read uh, just a few poems from the last section of my graduate thesis. It's called Your Father. Jay asks for another beer like alone, afraid it's patriarchal. He doesn't want to be a razor blade, but I'm going to the kitchen. I'm already up. Sometimes when we're in the middle of a memory becoming itself, I hear myself telling my future grieving teen, your father used to, with a faraway look in my eye. She's in a concert tee from a show she wasn't alive for and a band she doesn't listen to, but that makes her look edgy and irreverent. How we see ourselves before the McDonald's play place balls cork our holes and we are swallowed by the pit, still chewing what passes for apple pie. Your father used to pull his boxers up to his nipples, alternating fist cranks like Fonda in the 80s to make me giggle. Your father used to find complaint in every scrumptious meal he made so that I should start, so that I thought I should start a YouTube channel, The Dissatisfied Chef. Your father only fucked me like a Norseman when we were on vacation. Airbnb sex like laying brick. Your father installed a patio on my cunt in Portugal. Your father accidentally deleted all my college writing off of our mother drive, but he ate me out for two nights after so that I forgave him. Your father thought bananas gave him heartburn. Your father had a pathetically low bagel standard for which I almost left him. Your father's peace fingers were a love squall localizing on my hip and he worship jerk seasoning. Your father never raised his voice first, not once and barely ever. Your father rolled me in oats, flax, and cashew butter, ate me as energy bites when he was on sales calls. Your father never noticed the whole time I had acne because he was looking at my eyes and listening. Your father burnt like California in the sun. Your father was more intelligent than I was and he didn't read books, which enraged me. Your father was my solar panel before they were invented. Mozzarella was his Eucharist. In basketball shorts, he looked about your age. No one could have anticipated this. Come, hug your mother. Remember, put this memory in your mouth like the after dinner smoke he adored. Um, and this is called Shannons and Snakes. One, 
All the ways I've been a brother, screaming fuck me to Jay nude in the Parthenon stone stairwells in Queens, the medicine ball under Megan's shirt, forcing her to be more a woman at our pretend elementary baby shower, calling Kay a poser for wearing the same etnies we all had on our feet. When Jessica ran to the rock pillar trying to catch the bus, I laughed and laughed at her sprinting, smooshed face, her broken glasses, her screaming mother. Shannon alerts in the shed, the power in exclusion, the rush. Blue was a violent covert murderer I made up who stalked the wet streets of our neighborhood after night rain. I played the dutiful, devoted Navy girlfriend and later the scorned martyr, but really I was fucking whoever bought my last drink at bad weather. Cutting out Shannon's heads and leaving them in a box on her stoop, tricking her into eating dog food. My mother brings us to the mall, buys us wheelies and fanny packs, earrings and gel bracelets at Claire's. Her brother Hunter was little, born missing a piece of his heart. Her father had a voice like a die grinder bit. Brothers called her porker, propped their snouts and snorted at her. We called her mother spillery. She lost Shannon's guinea pig in a mom's only bunko game. How we fixated on the stain on Shannon's David Bridal eighth grade graduation dress. How we spit 40% off like loogies on her Charlotte Bruce pumps. Mine was motherfucking Vera Wang and I was proud of that till college. Shannon came over and unstuck the hot curling iron from out of my hair. She was a vision and it made me feel like the smell of burnt scalp. We all laughed when someone threw a textbook at her when she was drunk. Tyler's cum on her sweatshirt in our high school media lab, more likely pancake batter. Spillery drunk dodging bunnies on the parkway, passing condos blazing through the sliding windows after Shannon's sixth grade birthday. The, three sh the threesome she nervous giggled her way through, the cringy play-by-play -play we all received. The Key West hot tub with her strange sugar couple who showered her with saddles and bought us fancy drinks like Claire's earrings. She's in every disposable camera snap, all eyelashes and freckles. She rolls with proud boys now, but pays her own way to Fiji. Once she overturned her kayak in the Pine Barrens and panicked, thinking the river was full of eels and snakes. We made her feel stupid. But later at the birth, the kayak man would tell us, you're lucky to have kept all of your toes. You want, don't want to know all of the dangers in that water. Two. I first tasted sushi in high school with Allie and her family who ate together and seemed to really like each other. There was eel in it and I was young enough to feel my esophagus electrify. Garter snakes sizzling in the basketball courts they couldn't make it across. The suburban myth of an escape giant, of an escape pet giant boa in the backyard gobbling up a toddler. Carlos, ours, lost and never found. I see water snakes in my dreams and I can't remember if I've seen them for real or on Animal Planet. The temptation to be the person you were raised to be. Covered in Billy's snakes from the heated drawers, I felt powerful, cool, and in control. A snake in the grass, there's a snake in my boot, serpentine bodies of the pop divas I deified. The of a fire going out, could be anywhere, could pop out at any time. Fins and feathers, creatures I wanted or didn't want, fish the demilitarized zone, the desultory clerk I'd grow up to buy weed from in the room with, with the slow rabbits. Feed a snake a sick mouse and what it thinks will nourish it will kill it from the inside out. I pay a man to let me hold his monkey in the Marrakesh Medina. He tells me how his friend was bit by his cobra. The poison can come back. And all the tourists watched him die because they thought it was part of the show, the act. Sliding scale morality in an objection to feeding them something alive that looked like something I once loved. I don't know anyone who has been bitten by a snake, the ones that gum at your fingers when all the venom is taken out. They can't hurt you, but still trigger an ancient fear in us. How you can glimpse it one second and the next it's gone was never there in the leaf piles you're not supposed to play in because of the dog piss and passing cars. Danger you can't see or predict that comes at you fast, a fang on an ankle. The truth is we'd all like to be rare and dangerous. The proximity of colors and, fat and fatality, fast acting stuff. It, and I have the great pleasure of introducing one of my favorite writers and collage artists and humans in general, Max Parker. Their work has been featured in um, the Brooklyn Rail, the Southampton Review, and Mid Mag. Welcome, Max. 
Thank you, Grace. That was like the nicest introduction I could ever hope and dream for. <laughs> that was beautiful. I think I need more snakes and eels in my life. Um, so today I'm going to be reading the opening of part two of my novel. Um, but I've cut out all the context that you would need. So I think it's going to be a relatively stress-free experience. Okay. Mostly I sat around waiting for time. The parents lived in an apartment complex in Southern California where the concrete got so hot it cracked in clean, long scars. In the brush, forgotten shopping carts in place of deer. I learned it was common to experience a flash of green light just before the sunset. Of course, the conditions had to be optimal. The woman in apartment two was a scientist who smoked a lot of cigarettes. We spent time together at the complex pool and she did most of the talking. At one point, there was an introduction, but I didn't remember her name, and by now it was too late to ask. The flash occurred because of the way the atmosphere bent sunlight, refracting cool while absorbing warm wavelengths. The scientist demonstrated this by flicking her cigarette until a few sparks spit onto the pavement and scattered to ash. That's violet light, the scientist said. Good luck for the heart. And every night before bed, I pictured myself speeding down a desolate highway on a small blue motorcycle, passing wiry desert brush and dodging tarantulas on the road, their eyes reflecting back in my, headlight, my headlights before I could see the bodies. Due to reasons beyond my understanding, everyone in SoCal loved ketamine. That was really what they called it, SoCal, one word. Everyone was always hurrying around, meeting celebrities and talking about K-holes. I considered the general culture more shallow than Seattle, where people at least pretended to care about gentrification. Anyway, I was complicit and could not complain. Recently, I'd seen Gwyneth Paltrow leaving an upscale fish market in Santa Monica. Her cheekbones were recognizable across the street. I was stopped at a red light, driving my father's car, watching the flashing crosswalk. Gwyneth wore sunglasses, high heels, silk, silk loungewear under a bulky trench coat. The crosswalk ch chanted, wait, wait, wait. I experienced a strong desire to pray. The car's AC sputtered out and still the world carried on. A small group of people on the sidewalk noticed Gwyneth and took her picture. I was on my way to pick up ketamine and dressed casually. On the radio, 40 wildfires in the state nearly half contained. The pedestrian kept pressing the button and Gwyneth moved on, the people sat back down, returned to their smoothies. Wait, spinach and kale, I guessed. Gwyneth got into a glossy fuel efficient vehicle and time returned to normal. I wanted to forget about Seattle or at least stop thinking about it. The light turned then and the pedestrian walked. I went to parallel bodies in space. I smell jasmine, car exhaust, my own sweat. The heat still and caught in my throat. Less carbs, that was what I needed. For one minute, it was all simple. This was the story. Not long after I'd been back, I ran into an almost friend from high school at the grocery store. That's where I went at the hottest part of the day. I walked laps in the air conditioned aisles. Her name is Jody with a Y, and she was seriously considering leaving her boyfriend for some TV actor whose name I never heard. So much catching up, Jody said. I didn't know her last name. Throughout the course of the conversation, Jody with a Y became increasingly insistent that I take the phone number of a single dad she had recently met online. It's not sexual, she said. He sells drugs to pay child support. I always found myself in these situations, which through no fault of my own, never ended clear cut. More trouble, more money I barely had. I told Jody I didn't need the number. His prices are fair, she said. You're not still snorting Coke, are you? We were in the cereal aisle. A disembodied Shaquille O'Neal pointed at me from behind a bowl of artificial fruit cereal. Like the Mona Lisa, his eyes followed no matter how I turned my head. Uncanny, that was the word. Let me give you his number, Jody said. That's what people are doing today, I asked, ketamine. People like me, Jody said. Sid, Dexter, Lulu, the art school kids, people like that. Jody wore big jeans and a tiny Betty Boop t-shirt. 
It was the Little Mermaid, but Betty Boop's face. Conceptually, K-holes were appealing, and I understood that. But how did Be Betty Boop get the rose if she didn't have any legs? It's just some novelty shirt, Jody said, from a vintage shop in LA. That's cool, I said. I love LA. I'll probably move here forever and start a lemon orchard in my backyard. Jody, <laughs> Jody. Jody nodded enthusiastically. Totally, she said. Your skin looks great. How do you wash your face? I told Jody that I washed my face normally, but used a cold jade roller in the evenings and wore thick night cream in the day. In SoCal, people preferred enigmatic personalities. The more enigmatic, the better. I'm giving you his number, Jody said. Trust me, his prices are fair. Your skin has never looked better. Jody wrote the man's number on the inside of my wrist and relayed the system. Trust me, she said, his prices are very fair. That's it. <laughs> Um, last but never least, I have the great pleasure to introduce Quinn A. Dykes, who is an MFA candidate at Stony Brook University, and his work has won honorable mention in Glimmer Train's January, February 2017 short story award for new writers, and he's currently working on a novel. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of flash fiction pieces. This is the longest one. It's kind of sexy. It's called The Swing Room. You walk up to their house, a split level ranch with white shutters, the same as every other on its block. Allison lets you in and brings you to the den. She looks exactly like her pictures. She's 32, five foot three, a librarian. In the den is her husband, Mark, sitting on a black leather couch drinking wine. It's so cliche you want to puke, but you say hello and shake his damp hand. He too looks like his pictures, thin with a buzzed head and a goatee. He tells Allison to fetch you a drink and she huffs into the kitchen. He asks about your job, if you grew up on the island. You hate small talk, skip it. You'll know what you're there for. You've never let a couple use you before, but you've always wanted to try. Gender configuration doesn't matter. It's the act itself, giving yourself over. Something exciting about that, even if they're strangers. Allison asks if you both want to go upstairs. The swing room, Mark says. Allison tells him to stop calling it that. Nobody says swinging anymore. Swinging is old fashioned. It makes her think of big mustaches and leather caps. Mark asks you if there's anything wrong with being old fashioned, but you don't say anything because you hate being put on the spot and because you haven't been touched in a year. You leave your wine on the coffee table and follow them upstairs. Your heart beats, your head grows light. The swing room has a king size bed with satin sheets, another cliche you force yourself to ignore, but is separate from their bedroom. Allison climbs into the bed and pats the spot in front of her. You sit. Mark closes the door. He flicks one switch to turn off the ceiling lights and another that fills the room with red from a shadeless lamp. Mark slides in next to the two of you and grazes your thigh and your heart goes off again. You feel dizzy and tingly and Allison puts her arm around you and then she pulls you in and kisses you. She wraps her hand around the back of your head and yanks out a clump of hair. And you shudder. It's what you've wanted. Mark plucks strands one by one. You haven't been touched in a year. They do this until you're completely bald. Then they lay you flat on the bed and undress you. Mark yanks off your pants and then your legs, which pop out of their sockets. Pain shoots up your body and you moan. Allison does the same with your arms. The red bulb casts a glow as if you're all on fire. You don't have to tell them to keep going. Mark grabs your dislocated leg. Allison knees on the other for leverage and he rips it off. They repeat this until you're nothing but a head and torso. You stare up at the red ceiling, beautiful. This is what it means to give yourself over and you aren't even bleeding. You've seen the videos online, the models never bleed either. Mark and Allison get naked. They stand over you and kiss. They throw long black shadows on the wall and they look so good together. You're glad you could do this for them and you aren't even bleeding. They fall twisting and writhing on top of you. You feel as if you're going to float through the two of them and into the ceiling. Mark fondles your severed arm, locks his fingers in yours and Allison spanks him with your right leg. When they're finished, they'll put you back together. But until then, you lie there and watch. This is, after all, what you wanted. You understand some things, but you'll never understand others. You just never will. All right, next one is called Beer Cans. When somebody likes a band, they throw beer cans at them. It's like burping to compliment the chef. Basement and loft apartments are more fun than real venues, and I've seen bands play in skate parks, hallways, pizza places, boiler rooms, under bridges, inside of abandoned psychiatric centers. 
they bring their own generators to power everything. I once played a show that started at two in the morning, but movies are never accurate. There's fewer Mohawks and nobody sniffs glue. Cocaine is different, but cocaine doesn't phase me. Somebody tells me that crack is just cocaine, but better. I've never tried either, but I sniffed glue once in middle school. Every week, another friend of a friend dies. And then I find punks live forever written on a toilet in Sharpie. Like if you put it in writing, it'll come true. It's the last one. It's called, I'm sorry. I told you that I was sorry, but you didn't respond. And so I sent another text, called you on the phone, tried to FaceTime you, knocked on your door, waited, knocked again, emailed, regular mailed, a handwritten letter, a postcard from Mexico City, a caricature of us on the Coney Island boardwalk, a box of cashews, the read translation of Crime and Punishment, an original copy of The Cure's Pornography on vinyl, a mixtape on CD, a mixtape on tape, a year subscription to PlayStation Plus, a gift certificate for an oil change, coffee beans, a coffee grinder, French press, mocha pot, espresso machine, a new pair of Doc Martens, because when I saw you for the last time, the soles on your current pair were worn down. And sometimes we all get a little worn down. There's nothing wrong with it, but I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I knocked on your door. I knocked on your window. I knocked on your door, wrote you a song, called your mother, took out an ad in Newsday, a commercial on the radio, a billboard on your route to work. Nearly anyone, but not you, can be bought these days thanks to the internet. And so I paid Mick Foley $135 to record a video begging you to forgive me. Another text. Did you see the video? A second billboard. I knocked on your door. Another handwritten letter, this time left under your windshield wiper, so I know you got it. A banner above the freeway. A skyrider at Jones Beach. Please forgive me, the airplane coughed out. Please, 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 until the sky was full and there was nowhere left for my apology to go. That's it. Thank you. Okay, I will jump in here and direct everybody's attention to uh, the chat on YouTube where you are welcome to ask questions. Um, and Julie will be moderating. Uh, Hi everyone. Oh my gosh, first let me just say how wonderful that was to hear you all reading. Oh my gosh, you're all up to something really energetic and different from each other. Um, but then there were these like weird, you know, confluences. The eels met the tarantulas, and it was just so magical. Terrific job! And I'm looking through the chat. You guys, uh, jump in with a question if you'd like to ask your professors anything about their own lives as writers. Lives as writers. Lives as writers. I'll start us off Lives with a question. Anyone who feels um, moved to jump in. And it's about balance. You're teaching. You're taking your own classes. And you're obviously producing amazing work. What are some strategies that have worked for you to find a balance so that one part doesn't take over everything else? Uh, coffee, lots of coffee. <laughs> uh, I try to make a schedule, I think it's like, because there's so much work to do. So I think it's like really the only way I can like not go insane is to kind of be a little regimented about when I have like a lot of stuff. Um, so that's the question I ask myself every day and the answer is always different. <laughs> so um, I, I think acknowledging when I need to rest is actually the key because a lot of us are excited about the work that we do, even though there's a lot of it. And so if I find I'm not able to do it when I sit down and I try, that's usually not um, super common. Most of the time I can get the work done or some of it done. So if I'm at a point where it's just not happening at all, then you have to have like faith in yourself and know that tomorrow it probably will and just, you know, take the night off. Um, 
hopefully without guilt, but that's probably something that everyone always struggles with anyway. Or I remind myself, you live in capitalism and then <laughs> take a break after that. Nice. Uh, we have a question specifically for Alex Nyakowski um, from your student, Kayla. When did you decide to become a writer and professor? Um, I, I decided, uh, Max, I think, I think Max knows this story. Um, I decided to become a writer when I watched Jurassic Park for the first time as like a five-year-old. Um, I mean, that's, you know, like, I don't know. I, I, I always kind of wanted to do it. Um, the professor stuff came later on when I realized that, um, I need to, you know, have, have some, have some form of income to support, uh, all of my unpublished writing. Fair enough. We live in capitalism, as someone pointed out. Um, two connected questions. Um, how long do these, the pieces we heard today, for example, how long does something like that take to produce? And what is it like to be creative on a deadline? Um, and also, uh, do you, s wait, that wasn't the other one. There was another one that was connected. Well, let's just hear, hear uh, any responses to that. How long does it take you to produce something as beautiful and brilliant and polished as what we heard today? Um, I could jump in with, I did in the month of August, just an hour of time writing every day because I knew I had this section of poems I needed to generate. Um, and so if you figure that's 30 hours of writing, I got 10 poems out of it, which is like on the much higher end than you would usually <laughs> get. So I would say it's the, yeah, and I'm definitely not that disciplined on, on a regular basis, uh, much more of a last minute person, but making yourself do like an hour is doable. So just setting a timer and doing an hour, then you get, you get a, at least a bunch you can weed through in the end. Yeah, how about Amy, how about you? How long did your essay take? Um, so I'm a fan of deadlines because I'm sure like everyone else here, I, I lack discipline. It's definitely easier to sit around watching Netflix than actually do what you're supposed to do. So, um, that was an assignment for Luann's class and it went through a few re revisions. Um, and so I, I wrote it last year. So about a year ago. Um, but a lot of times kind of like Karina, like, um, if I try to force myself to write and I'm just really exhausted, I'm really emotionally drained. Um, nothing's going to come out of it. Nothing good's going to come out of it. So I definitely think there's a balance of, of rest and creative time. Um, I also think relying on your community is really important. I definitely reach out to other people in the MFA program um, for either support when it comes to teaching or writing. Um, and sometimes we meet up and write together, you know, via Zoom. Um, so that's just how I, I'm still learning like everyone else. So. Awesome, yes, this is the connected question. Um, do you have a page count for yourself? If so, how many pages do you write per day? So that would be on the give yourself a more sort of re either an hour or a page count. Um, and I'd be curious, Hannah, Chelsea, how about you guys? Do you have some kind of system like that? Sorry, Max and Chelsea. Um, well, right now I'm, I'm producing like around 10 or so pages, but that's strictly because of thesis work. Um, so yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm generating a lot these days. Um, but yeah, whether any of that is usable, um, that's a question for like Chelsea next year. Um, but yeah, I think like deadlines are helpful. Having a page count is helpful, but um, I wouldn't I'm still not at the point where I can tell myself, okay, today you're gonna write three to four pages and then tomorrow you're gonna write another three to four pages. I'm still not at that point yet. Hmm. Max, how about you? Um, I've honestly been working on the same like 30 pages for the past four months. So I'm probably not a very like helpful person to ask um, in the sense that I work in like chunks of things and kind of obsessively perfect that 
probably to the extent that it's not advice I would give to someone else. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really into like measured paragraph breaks and that is a downfall. Um, but I think of it in like subjects, like I'm gonna sit down and write um, a fragment or a chapter about going to like a cactus party where the two people exchange cactuses and how do you pick out a cactus for that? Um, and like kind of go into like a research hole um, by subject and organized idea rather than page count. I find if I get on page counts, I kind of get a little frazzled and I set up a hole for me to disappoint myself, but I'm a very slow writer. So I guess it depends. <laughs> the unit is the scene, right? Mm -hmm. The time unit or page unit, it's, it's the scene itself that you know is one of the building blocks in the longer project. And we had a qu question about that. Have any of you ever had a massive project like with a year or more of planning and how did that experience go? And I suspect that several of you are in that midst of that right now and we call it thesis, right? So Quinn, you're in thesis, right? I am. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm working on a novel um, the question is more so, what was it like? Um, the first draft of the novel, I kind of wrote in this, like, well, it was actually a short story that I decided to just turn into a novel. So I kind of had the plot arc there, but I kind of just wrote the whole first draft in like a summer. And that was probably like two years ago. And I've just been working on it ever since then. And I'm at the point where I feel like I'm going insane. I never want to look at it again, but I need to finish it, obviously. So yeah, that's my experience. It's very stressful and annoying. And a lot of days you sit down and you hate it, but yeah. Yeah, anyone else want to chime in on the, the challenges of a longer form or a long-term project? I think for myself, I first had the idea of writing a memoir like three years ago. And then when I was very slowly producing work on my own. I was like, maybe I should get a master's and have someone make me write. Um, but again, it is definitely, it's a marathon. It's not a race. Um, I think from what I'm hearing from the, the year above me, it's the revision is, is key. Um, so right now I'm still in the generative phase. Um, and it's just kind of like that some days, like what Quinn said, some days you hate it and some days you question yourself, but you keep doing it because there's something pushing you to do it, so. Nice. I, I'm also gonna chime in. Oh, go ahead. I also think, like, I know we talked about how restrictions are good um, for us, like, to, to force us to produce work. I also think, like, when going about a larger project, um, it's important to not think of uh, deadlines and whatnot, because, I don't know, like, Amy and Quinn, like, jump in if, you agree or don't agree um but like i kind of feel like when you when you when you approach a longer project like you have to recognize the fact that it's going to be a long process um and that writing to a deadline is almost like this way of accelerating it in a way that like could make the actual work itself like metastasize and take on uh we can say like uh maybe not flaws but little things that like like are outside of your control because you're trying to force like like i mean i'm thinking of thesis specifically like you're trying to hit this thing but ultimately you know somewhere deep down that like oh there's a potential that i could work on this for four years for five years for six and you just have like you kind of have to like give yourself over to that like 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 delay the gratification of of it being finished because it could take a very very long time um kind of bouncing off of what alex said i find smaller deadlines or checkpoints helpful but what i have realized is that sometimes when i take i'll take months off sometimes or especially when COVID started i would write a lot one month and then nothing for the next month and at first that upset me um, but then I realized having that space in between working on, on a, lo a longer work actually can be helpful because you're, you're giving yourself 
a chance to take a breath and maybe think about things a little bit differently and come back to the page. Um, or you're still doing work, but it's, um, it's just in a different form because thinking about your book is, I would say, almost just as important as actually getting the words out. Um, of course, you still need to do that. Otherwise, you don't have a book and writers can get caught in the I'm just thinking constantly um, mode, I suppose. But yeah, um, giving yourself that freedom or knowing that you can work on things for as long as you feel it needs um, is, I think, helpful as well beyond a, a program, uh, you know, checkpoint, which is just to help you as much as you can. Yeah, it's such an interesting balance of, of you know, pen on paper and that e sometimes underestimated importance of imagining and mulling over things and letting the world feed your project with your own experience and with research, for example, that uh, Max was talking about. We have a question that flips us back to our um, roles as teachers. Do you find your experience teaching informs your own work or vice versa? I am so inspired by my students um, and the last few classes I've taught their work like continually like knocks me off my feet and then makes me want to push myself to be a better writer. So I would say um, for sure I get inspired by my students all the time, whether it be their nonfiction fiction or poetry. I think also like teaching writing like forces you to use like a part of your brain like your writing brain that you don't normally use I feel like I've like I've like learned a lot about teaching like about writing through teaching that I don't think I would have ever realized had I not done it you know what I mean I think it's something every writer should do at least like once yeah I also choose course topics um that leave room for discovery for me as I'm teaching or that are related to the things that I'm deeply curious about or the things that I am writing about or want to be writing about. Um, so in that sense, it, coming to class is also like being able to play and brainstorm with other writers and, and kind of feed off that energy together and discover together. Um, so I, I find teaching something totally not related, let's say, to what I would want to do um, just doesn't really sound as appealing. Yeah, anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah, just this, oh, sorry, Julie. Yeah, just the same. Um, I'm so I'm so excited to be teaching. I definitely um, learn so much from my students. Um, and definitely, and kind of what what Quinn said. I think it definitely activates another part of of your brain. And almost kind of going back to the 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 really beginnings almost of the craft and how to write and like the stuff that I learned lo a long time ago and it's kind of replenishing in my mind and you know things like scene and summary and I have to look at my own writing and, and be like where am I missing that um, but I just feel so privileged to be teaching such amazing students um, so that in itself is a gift yay and then we have some fun questions about sort of, I guess, back to writing process. What's your favorite place where you find solace while writing? Do you listen to music? Do you write in silence? What are some fun or unique sources of inspiration? Um, Chelsea, tell us a little bit about. Um, sure, so I like to write where there's no one around. So it can be anywhere, I just have to be alone. Um, and I, I think the other question was about music. Um, I like to listen to music. I particularly enjoy listening to songs I don't know. So it kind of makes me feel like I'm in a big room, like with a conversation happening that I don't know anything about. So it kind of acts as white noise, but it definitely sets a tone. Um, and some sources of inspiration. Um, Recently, I, I mean, sometimes it's just Pinterest. 
Um, but sometimes it's a conversation that I'll have that sparks some sort of idea and will make me think of, of some, a memory or something. So usually it's just like the conversation I just had with my mother in the kitchen. <laughs> Um, I was going to say I love to write on my fire escape because um, I love to write in the sun. Uh, and I listen to, currently when writing my thesis, I was listening to jazz because I found I couldn't have lyrics in the background. But when I wrote my undergraduate thesis a million years ago, I listened to a ton of like Nas and A Tribe Called Quest because it's just a very different like texture to the work. So I think it like depends on if you want those that music in the background to be influencing your work or not. And I feel like the jazz just helps me to find my rhythm, but also doesn't um, influence me with lyrics. I do live for those YouTube, like indie or jazz coffee shop, like three hour long um, streams. So that reminded me of that. Um, currently it's Rare by Selena Gomez, um, that album. I, I listen to a lot of music that, uh, I don't know, it's like different. What I write with is usually different from what I listen to directly. Also Folklore by Taylor Swift. So that kind of like poppy, like subdued pop in the background, um, totally unrelated, but keeps the energy a little. How about anyone else with inspiration coming from say the conversation you just had in the kitchen or that kind of or eavesdropping. I'm a big eavesdropper. That works for me. Um, I like to kind of like eavesdrop on books that I admire. Um, <laughs> so every day, like when I sit down to write, I'll pick out like a stack of four or five books and basically like speed read them. Um, and I like do a mix of something that's exactly like what I want to write or very close to it something that's very different from what I want to write, like usually like a nonfiction or poetry or like a poetic theory book um, that's like turning on the part of my mind that's paying attention to language. And like that usually sends me on this like <laughs> intense thought pattern of how can I bring that into the prose and like just essentially like shuffling through a bunch of books without getting into like a rut of, oh, I want to write something that's exactly like uh, Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney, which when I was reading that book, I felt so discouraged because I knew I could never write that book because it had been done. <laughs> um, and so I've been trying to like turn on like, like uh, Karina Gray said, like jazz or something without a lot of noise and basically just like overwhelming my noise with like other people's words to kind of get myself into the zone, but not pigeonhole where I want my zone to be, if that makes sense. <laughs> but it's like, it's a little crazy. I don't know if I'd, <laughs> you have to train your brain to do it, I think, anyway. And I think that uh, prompted a follow-up question. What writers, artists, and influencers inspire you to write? And we'll just uh, round robin, everyone chime in and I'll, uh, Kick it back to Molly after that. Uh, so Alex, who inspires you? Oh, I was on mute. Um, can I can I go last? Um, <laughs> sure. I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I. I Yeah, cause I, I need I need a second. I need a second before I shoot my mouth off about yeah, things right. that like. Grace, how about you? Um, go tos that I could read anytime. Just so I need inspiration. Claudia Ranke and Terrence Hayes, Frank O'Hara, Pablo Neruda. Amy, how about you? Oh gosh, um, I really I I like to um, look at writers who kind of bend genre um, or just bend form. Um, cause I'm getting really into that, but as you know, a one trick pony, I'm, I mostly do nonfiction. Um, I would definitely say Katherine Harrison, Lydia Yaknovich. Um, what else do I like? Um, one of my favorite memoirs is Angela's ashes, which is kind of old, but I, I love it. And I, for that as a beginning, as an intro to a memoir is really creative. Um, Carmen Maria Machado, um, Ocean Vong, um, you know, they kind of border 
that uh, nonfiction memoir with other other creative um, modes. So that for me always inspires me. Yeah, Karina. Uh, um, well, for my thesis specifically, which is nonfiction, um, Edmund De DeWall, who wrote The Hair with Amber Eyes, um, and Daniel Miller, who's an anthropologist, but also a, sort of a writer, um, and Maggie Nelson. Those are the three I kind of keep circling and try to steal bits from. Um, but also, uh, all times are very differently. Uh, John Green, who uh, now does nonfiction and is YA novelist, uh, and John Milton, Paradise Lost series, so obsessed. Um, and then the thing they have in common is the word John. Yeah, I like a lot of Johns. It seems <laughs> surprise. <laughs> um, Yusuf Kaminaka as well, um, very much so. I have other names, but those are like the big ones. Chelsea, how about you? Um, a lot of my faves are mentioned, but I will add um, Alex Chi, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Maggie Nelson, I believe was mentioned, Chelsea Hodson, Alyssa Washuda. I, I, like, um, I like particularly essay collections. So any writer who's doing something like that is, is really cool for me. Yeah, uh, Grace, did you already, Grace, she already, uh, so now my little list is getting, Quinn, oh, Quinn. Oh, Quinn. Um, <laughs> lately, Donald Barthelme, uh, Dennis Johnson, Chekhov, um, who else? I'm like blanking. I don't know. Yeah, them lately. I mean, it changes all the time, I think. But those are the ones lately that I've been reading. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I go through phases like that where I love, I'm in love with everything I read. It's so delightful. And Grace, did we, did you chime in? You were about to chime in. No, I did. <laughs> you did. Okay. So does that mean, Alex, I think it is finally your turn? I can chime in if Alex still wants oh, to go no, last. I'm sorry, Max. It's okay. Um, Max. <laughs> My little if boxes. If you want to go, go. But I'm I kind of am nervous about going last because I feel like I've turned oh. into a thing. Okay, uh, go last. But, like, I can also right, you go, go last. You go. I'll go last. I'm fine with it. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Take it away. Positive. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I just yeah. I, I guess. I, 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 I sat there and I ended up, the reason I have so much agita about this now is because I ended up just circling back to the same people that I thought that I was gonna say initially, which I mean, uh, so I mean, the sort of, the writer that like I first read that like made me want to do this was, uh, was Thomas Pynchon. Um, and so his early novels are books that I go back to all the time. And then um, I think um, a book recently um, uh, is, is, is Hopscotch by Julio Cortazar, um, which totally like broke my mind apart and uh, almost made me want to quit writing because it was so good. Um, but yeah, um, and, and then, you know, various, various poets throughout uh, the years, even though I don't read poetry in a really concentrated way. I, I think I, I, I just read it as in a weird, broad way manner so i can't really speak to that gertrude stein that's who I um i really feel excited and inspired by writers who like i think of writers who tell it as it is um like joan didion or ben lerner or uh amy hempel mary robeson um chris kraus uh essentially like writers who like don't flinch away from being human and saying the things that I think everyone's thinking but no one wants to admit to or no one has like put a name to or put down in writing and like the ways and the power you can kind of like then once you've said it queer that and make that something that uh is kind of like ripe for the picking but is founded in something that's like really human and kind of like an objective statement um that's a handful of, oh, and The Idiot by Elif Badaman is like one of my favorite books I read this last year. 
Fantastic, Molly. Am I just closing closing out yeah. the uh, event? Thanks for letting me guest Q and A, you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thanks to all the readers and Julie and Frank. And um, the next uh, reading is November 4th. That's going to be with Miranda Beeson and me. So we'll see you then. Uh, thanks again to all the readers. We'll see you next time.